Oh, hey everyone, this is Amateur Meteorologist Cameron Fry with the second installment in our 2013-2014 Winter Weather Forecast series. As mentioned previously, back uh, at the end of September, uh, I said I would be working on another video uh, that would air by today. And I wanted to give a month's time to kind of reflect on some of the changes that the, the atmosphere would inevitably throw at us. And it does appear that uh, the scene and the, uh, the my forecast has altered a little bit, but that's not surprising. I had totally predicted that. So these next couple of maps will cover some material that wasn't covered in my previous video that ended up back in September. Just a few more pieces of telecommunication criteria that I look at and assess when it comes to predicting winter weather. Also, uh, after I show these maps and charts, uh, I will go over a bit more all in package you know some thoughts in terms of what we can inspect in terms of snow amount totals uh, temperature anomalies and patterns and trends that I think will establish themselves starting in early December and and seeing if they will hold for it through January and February and even maybe March because we can't really discount March even though that's a transitional month um, so let's, before I say anything else, let's get right to it, and let's get to those maps. We'll start off by taking a look at some other sources and what they predict in terms of the 2013-2014 winter weather season. We have a mixed bag of results, as it turns out, and I simply looked around and did some modest research just to see what other groups, other organizations, other amateur meteorologists like myself are saying. And really, when we look at it, we really can't come to a determination of what's going to happen, although we can see some trends and some overlapping similarities uh, from one winter weather prediction to the next. Um, some of them I don't really buy. Others I buy parts of. I think the most common case is I you know, agree with certain elements. But we kind of just want to look at what are some of the overlapping beliefs, what are some some of the trends we see and based on what I can tell I could say that we're going to be in an active pattern here in the southeast again for those of you who have, are just tuning in to my one or fourth cast videos I'm mostly focused in the mid-south and the middle Tennessee the Tennessee Valley region maybe southern Ohio Valley but if we look at this map real quick I just want to stop and focus here just because I tend to agree with it more than the previous maps we saw. I really think that when we factor in all the ingredients, we're looking at a pretty average so-so winter. Not as bad as the previous two years, but really nothing to get too excited about. I hate to break it to you. I know we're all wanting another repeat of 2009-2010 if you're in the Mid-South or Mid-Atlantic region. I do think that we're going to see the jet stream fluctuate dramatically this winter. I don't think we're going to see a dominant zonal flow. I think, like in this graphic presented here, that we're going to see some clippers, uh, Alberta clippers, be probably the dominant winter weather producer in the central and eastern United States, especially for the Great Lakes and Northeast, obviously. I think the jet is going to dip and it's going to rise and it's going to do a bunch of things. Uh, in more amplified fashion, as I mentioned in my previous video, that hasn't changed. Uh, real quickly, I want to take a look at the AccuWeather snowfall prediction map. I actually tend to agree with this a little bit. I think that the below average zone is a, is a bit too west, but I'm a little biased because, you know, I'm Seminole, Tennessee. I wouldn't be surprised if this ends up happening. I, their snowfall map from last year busted, so I'm aware of that. I think this year they're doing a better job capturing what is most likely to happen with respect to the current telecom factors we're going to look at. I mentioned last time how we're in a negative PDO regime. It's interesting to note that 39 of the past 40 months have seen a negative PDO. I still think that the warmer than normal sea surface temperatures off the Gulf of Alaska or in that Lucia region will play a role. I know that a negative PDO tends to promote a warmer southeastern U.S. However, I think that it's going to merge with other telecom factors that lead to at least average conditions in this neck of the woods. I really don't think the negative PDO will be as negative as it has been in previous years. It will be kind of minimal, so I don't think it's going to promote 
an anti-snow, anti-cold pattern at all. Again, part of predicting winter weather, we have to look at how sea surface temperature anomalies interact with what's going on in the mid and upper levels of the atmosphere. Can we note any patterns, any trends of blocking? And so far this fall, we've seen that. We've seen that in the northern Pacific, mid-Pacific regions. We've seen it off, you know, the coast of Greenland. We've kind of seen some hints of an omega blocking pattern time to time. We saw a very cool, very blocky pattern set up the last two weeks of October heading into November. Although we're going to see a pattern change here headed to head into this first full week of November, I think we could take some lessons learned from the month of October, which was very flip-floppy. It was very warm in the first half, very cold in the second half, and precipitation was pretty average. I think this is a good indicator of what we're going to see. Okay, I want to talk real quickly about the PNA. This stands for the Pacific North American Telecommunication Pattern. This is associated with strong variances in the strength and location of the Eastern Asian jet stream. Okay. So we have two phases, just like with a lot of other telecommunications, a negative and a positive phase. The negative phase refers to blocking activity in the high latitudes of the northern Pacific. This typically forces colder air to plunge into the western third of the U.S. And this also allows the notorious southeastern ridge to become an impact player in the southeast. So negative PNA is something we root against if you love winter and you love snow and you love actual winter in this part of the country. Now, the positive phase is what we root for. It's something that we hope happens. It features above average barometric pressure or heights around Hawaii in the inner mountain region of North America with below average heights south of the Aleutian Islands and over the southeastern U.S. This, in turn, promotes above average temperatures over the western, over western Canada, the western third of the U.S., and below average temperatures across the south central and southeastern United States. So if you live in the south, with the exception of the southwest, you win in, in a positive PNA. And my prediction at the moment is that we'll see a positive PNA around 60% of the time this winter, meteorological winter from December 1st to the end of February. Part of that's gut feeling. Part of that is looking at other telecom factors. All right, so last year I thought we would see more of this setup, a, a weak El Nino, the emergence of the polar jet with the subtropical jet, which leads to the perfect storm of moist, and cold air coming together. Now I don't think this is going to happen this year. I think this will happen in small doses, but I wanted to point this out that even though the ENSO is forecasted to be neutral, if it were to creep positive, and some there's some people saying it could go slightly negative, but if it were to go remain slightly positive like it was kind of drifting the direction it was going in uh, not that long ago, this could be a reality. So again, we kind of root for a weak El Nino around here. Just wanted to point that out as a reminder. So taking into consideration what we know about the ENSO, the PDO, as well as the PNA, we look at how all three of these particular ingredients need to come together to produce cold air in the south. If we can get that high dominating in the Pacific and producing that strong western ridge, if that high is far east enough, where it's actually affecting land mass in the western third of the U.S., we could see that blocking pattern set up. We look at the flip side, the Greenland block, which is indicative of a negative NAO, which is something that we may see this winter. Uh, when these two blocking patterns combine, we get that omega pattern that I referenced to earlier. That's the perfect storm to where the south central and the southeastern can cash in on colder air masses coming down from Canada. One last map real quick. We're going to look at the CFS forecast. You get Again, they're picking up on the ridging in the western of the U.S. It's partly effect of the warm sea temperature anomalies off the Gulf of Alaska and the Aleutian region. You can see how that allows the colder air masses to affect parts of the Great Lakes, New England area. So something to keep in mind, something to watch for as we head into meteorological winter soon. A couple of closing comments here. I note that the QBO is going is positive and will be falling throughout the winter months. The rate of snow cover in the Eurasia region has dramatically decreased. Maybe dramatically is too strong. It was looking good about a month ago, but uh, the pickup has slowed down enough to for me to think that it could lead to a positive AO. I, I think that the NAO is, and AO are going to go back and forth this winter. However, I don't think it's going to be predominantly negative. And also the solar flux. Again, a month or two ago, we were looking at uh, 
it was looking pretty low, looking at almost record low values, uh, or lower than we've seen in quite some time, and we've seen the activity pick up. So will this be a repeat of 2001, 2002? I don't know. I really don't know. But again, when you juggle all these different ingredients up, like I said last time, this is going to be something you hear from me over and over again. I think we have a lot of factors on one side promoting it's going to be cold and snowy this winter, and others on the other side saying, nope, not the case, hold on. It will be another warm winter, the third year in a row, where we see kind of a bland, boring, dull winter. So I'm still holding on that it's going to be kind of a so-so average. We're going to be in this battleground region here if you live in Middle Tennessee. If you go further south and east, I think regions like Atlanta and Charlotte, you have a better chance of seeing a warmer winter uh, with less snowfall. However, the further north and west you go, if you're in the Ohio Valley, Great Lakes, if you live in the Upper Plains, I think you could definitely catch in this winter. So we shall see. And though I don't have maps ready at the moment, I'm going to go ahead and give my preliminary snowfall estimates for Middle Tennessee. I think we're going to see between 4 and 6 inches of snow this winter, which is right about average. If you look at the 30-year averages going back to 1980, and I think that we're going to see December temperatures a degree or two above normal, and January maybe between 0 and 1 degree above normal, and February 1 to 2 degrees colder than normal on average. So. Those are my preliminary thoughts on the numbers. Have a great night, everyone. This is amateur meteorologist Cameron Fry signing off. Until next time, expect my third and final video out by December 10th.